Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We will get started momentarily. We are just letting the room populate. We're going to get started just momentarily. We still have people coming into the webinar. We'll get started momentarily. If you do have a question for our panelists, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to submit a question for our panelists. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. My name is Margie Levin. I am the Assistant Regional Director, and I want to welcome you to our program tonight. Before we begin, um, we will share with you um, some instructions for Spanish language interpretation. Thank you so much. Hello, good evening. My name is Astrid Arroyave. I'm here with the Community Language Cooperative. We are opening up spaces for language justice, which means that we can talk in what we call the language of our hearts. Uh, I'd like to share with you a few guidelines to follow throughout the meeting. Uh, please let's, let's remember that Spanish is 25% more extensive than English. So please let's uh, talk at a comfortable pace, uh, the pace that is, uh, conversational. Uh, let's remember that an appropriate, an, an appropriate speed will go in detriment of the interpretation efforts, as the interpreter will be forced to edit the content of your message. Uh, at the end of this uh, small introduction that I'm going to repeat uh, in Spanish as well, you are going to see at the bottom of your screens the globe icon. May click on it and you can choose the channel of your preference, English or Spanish. You will have also uh, the option of muting the original audio so you don't have to hear two languages going on at the same time. Last but not least, when you are not talking, please mute your mic. Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Astrid Arroyave y estoy aquí con la Cooperativa Comunitaria del Lenguaje. Estamos abriendo espacios para la justicia del lenguaje, lo que quiere decir que podemos hablar en el idioma de nuestro corazón, es decir, en aquel en el cual nos podemos comunicar mejor. Eh, voy a compartir con ustedes algunas pautas para la interpretación durante esta sesión. Recordemos que el español es 25% más extenso que el inglés. Así que, por favor, hablemos a un ritmo cómodo y conversacional. También recordemos que una velocidad inadecuada irá en detrimento de los esfuerzos de interpretación, ya que el intérprete se verá obligado a editar el contenido de su mensaje. Al final de esta pequeña introducción y una vez se haya encendido la función de interpretación, ustedes verán en la parte de abajo el icono del globo terráqueo. Hagan clic allí. En él podrán escoger el canal de su preferencia, inglés o español. También tienen la opción de silenciar el audio original para que no tengan que eh, tener dos idiomas al mismo tiempo. Y ya para terminar, cuando no estén hablando, por favor, silencien sus micrófonos. Muchísimas gracias. Ya podemos eh, encender la función de interpretación. Thank you so much. We can turn on the interpretation function right now. Thank you. Oops. 
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us during Women's History Month and as we look toward International Women's Day next week. This is ADL Southwest and the Houston Rockets fourth annual Women's Summit. I am the Southwest Regional uh, Women's Initiatives co-vice chair, Rebecca Ahrens, and I have been so looking forward to today's program because I know it's going to be uh, informative and inspirational and inclusive. So before we begin, a little bit about ADL and why we have a women's initiative. ADL was founded in 1913 to fight anti-Jewish hate, but our founders quickly determined that you can't fight one kind of hate and ignore others. Um, so we all must work together, counteract exclusion and marginalization, disrespect and discrimination. Because when those things affect one of us, they affect all of us. And ADL's Women's Initiative was founded by committed leaders who knew that while we have come a very long way in obtaining equal rights for women, we still have a long way to go. So I'm gonna pass it over to Erica Windsor, who is our Women's Initiative co-vice chair, our other co-vice chair, to tell you more and to introduce our moderator for tonight. Erica, you're on mute. You are, we need you to unmute. It's like I haven't been doing this for two years. Sorry, everyone. My name is Erica Windsor, and I am honored to serve as a co-vice chair for ADL Women's Initiative. Thank you so much for joining our webinar in celebration of International Women's Day. The mission of ADL's Women's Initiative is to unite diverse women professionals in ADL's efforts to promote respect and challenge bigotry through dialogue and awareness, and that is what we're working towards tonight as we endeavor to break the bias. Knowing that bias exists isn't enough. We all need to take action to break the bias on International Women's Day and beyond. Today, we've compiled a panel of committed experts who will share the challenges that they faced as groundbreaking game changers in responding to bias in their lives and careers. We hope to learn how they plan to meet those challenges of breaking bias head on each and every day. Our moderator for today's program soon to be Dr. Clarenda McCready. Dr. Soon to be Dr. McCready is a wife, mother of four, philanthropist, best-selling author, student, and inspirational speaker who finds purpose in making a difference in the lives of girls and women. You may know her as the founder of Project PUSH, which stands for purpose-led, unstoppable, success-bound, and hope-filled. The 501c3 Nonprofit Foundation inspires and empowers women, funds educational pursuits through scholarships, and supports community and international outreach. Ms. McCready, we are so thrilled to have you as our moderator tonight, and we would like for you to introduce our panelists and start the conversation by telling us a little bit of your story. Absolutely. Good evening. And thank you so much, Erica, for that lovely introduction. I appreciate you. I am honored to be here today uh, to celebrate Women's History Month and to celebrate our upcoming uh, Women's International Day with our amazing panelists and a room full of others that are on the line here this evening. So I'm just going to jump right in and introduce our panelists. I'm going to introduce them starting in alphabetical order. Judge Phyllis Randolph Fry is an Eagle Scout, former member of the Texas A&M Corps of Cadets, a veteran, engineer, attorney, a father, a grandmother, a lesbian widow. She is also the first out transgender judge in the nation. In 1976, when she transitioned to be an out, Judge Fry was faced with the possibility of arrest each day because of the city of Houston ordinance 28-42.4, prohibiting cross-dressing. After four years of being lobbied by her, Houston, Texas, Houston City Council voted to repeal the ordinance in 1980. Now, having lived almost 60% of her life as the woman she's always felt herself to be, Phyllis remains on the cutting edge of LGBTQ plus community 
and especially transgender legal and political issues. Phyllis has received countless awards, including the Civil Rights Leader Award from ADL Southwest. Welcome, Phyllis. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Julie Nangia, Associate Professor of Medicine and Breast Medical Oncologist at the Dan L. Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. She is board certified in internal medicine and medical oncology. Dr. Julie specializes in the care of patients with breast cancer or at high risk to develop breast cancer. She is the director of breast cancer prevention and high risk program at Baylor College of Medicine and has a special interest in hereditary breast cancer, breast cancer prevention, and triple negative breast cancer. She is also the medical director of the Breast Care Center at Smith Clinic and Ben Taub General Hospital. She is best known around the world for her research with scalp cooling for the prevention of chemotherapy, induced alopecia, and was the national PI for the scalp trial, which is the only randomized clinical trial with scalp cooling devices in the world, which led to FDA clearance of a scalp cooling device in the U.S. Welcome, Dr. Julie. Next, we have Ms. Angelica Razo. She is the Texas Director for Me Family at Bota. She was raised in Arkansas with her larger-than-life Mexican family. Angelica and Halica first joined Me Familia Bota in 2017 to lead the organization's youth leadership program in Houston. She currently serves as the Texas State Director where she oversees the state's operations to increase political representation and power for the Latinx community through electoral advocacy and community organizing strategies. Her strong belief in community empowerment motivates her to engage others so they can find their own unique civil, civic role while participating in collective action. Ms. Razo is part of the Houston in Action Steering Committee. She also co-chairs the Government Affairs Committee the Coalition for Environment Equity and Resilience. She is on the Race Equity Leadership and Research Collective Steering Committee. She is a graduate of Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Emerging Leaders Institute. In 2021, she was featured in the Houston Chronicles inaugural edition of Extraordinario's 10 Houston Latinos Who Are Making a Difference. Welcome, Angelica. What a fabulous, panel with that we have today and I am so excited to share our stories and together learn more about how we can break the bias. So before we go any further, I just give a little bit of uh, background of, about me and uh, some of the, the areas where I have experienced bias. Um, my husband has had an extensive career as a former professional athlete. He actually spent many wonderful years uh, playing with our partner, the Houston Rockets. And I remember it was the day after a storm here in Houston, of course, Houston's always gonna have a storm, right? And we had much debris and, and leaves and branches in our, um, air, in our yard, in our patio area. And I was finishing up a conversation with someone on the phone and I mentioned to them, that, oh, I need to go, I have to go and you know clean up the yard or whatnot. And so I remember the person uh, making a snarky little comment and they said, who you? No way. I thought all you did was sit around the pool and eat bonbons all day. <laughs> How ridiculous. But even more ridiculous is that there are dozens and dozens of these type of similar comments and beliefs over the years that people have made about me and other wives of professional athletes that all comes down to negative microaggressions, false assumptions, and stereotypes about who we are. And speaking of who we are, and speaking of stereotypes and microaggressions and false assumptions, what an appropriate and timely theme of Break the Bias for today's ADL Women's Initiative. And with that, let's jump right in with our amazing panelists. Okay, are we ready panelists? Yes, <laughs> yes, fingers from, from Phyllis. <laughs> Awesome. Well, let's jump right in. Um, I'm going to start with, with you, Phyllis, just because you gave me the spirit fingers. I saw you first. 
Why do you think it's important to celebrate women and their accomplishments? Let's start there. Well, I'm proud to be a woman. I fought most of my life to be a woman. In fact, I remember <clears throat> when I was five or six years old and <clears throat> my mother, uh, I was on vacation with cousins and my mother was taking me out of my swimsuit, put me in uh, dry clothes and my cousin was uh, about 10 feet away and, and my aunt was doing the same thing for her. And I, I looked and I said, I looked at her and I looked at me and I looked at her and I said, that's what I want. Anyway, that was 19, early 1950s. You don't tell your parents things like that in the early 1950s. And every time I did anything that was effeminate, uh, it was always, I was always accused of being sissified. So I learned how to be a very, very successful guy. Uh, I tell people I'm a great actress. And in 1976, I finally, with the love and acceptance of my uh, then wife, who passed away two years ago, uh, I transitioned and became Phyllis. And as you know, you read, I had to fight the city of Houston because I was subject to arrest every day with the cross-dressing ordinance that was in effect. And uh, I lost my military career because I wanted to be a woman. And as I was transitioning to become a woman in 1976, the Houston engineering community blackballed me. Uh, and it was a long, long, long fight with my then wife, Trish, by my side. Now, <clears throat> I could go on and on, but I'm not. All of this, my biography was written by Michael Long and Shay Tuttle, and it's coming out June the 12th, and it'll be titled Phyllis Fry and the Fight for Transgender Rights. You can also Google my name. Uh, there's just tons of stuff about me. So that's all I need to, to say at this time, except I've always wanted to be a woman. I am a woman, and uh, I'm very proud. Well, thank you for sharing. That's such a rich history and you've got such a world of knowledge and experience. So we thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. I'm gonna jump right over to uh, Dr. Julie. Can you share with us, you know, why do you think it's important to celebrate women and their accomplishments? It's, it's so important because if you look at leadership roles, no matter the discipline, it's so underrepresented, not just for women, but, but also by race and many other things. And, you know, my personal experience, you know, women have a tough time, you know, making it into these roles. And there are multiple reasons. One is, you know, for many, many years, it, especially in medicine, you know, in the medical field, it was a very male dominated field. And then even when women came into medicine, the leadership positions were all men. And, you know, there was just this culture of just you know, work-life balance. You know, if you want to be successful, a lot of women never had children and you can do both, you know, you don't have to. And then the other thing I've experienced is an age bias. You know, when people look young, they're not taken as seriously. And so it's not just a gender bias, it's an age bias, it's a race bias. And a lot of people don't even realize that they're biased in their actions or what they're doing. And, um, my personal experience in medicine is that often women are kinder leaders. The staff respects the way they lead more and they create a better like work life balance and culture. And, um, you know, that's not absolute, but I think it's very important. Um, the other thing I, I work in the Harris health system here in Houston, which is a safety net hospital where we see a lot of, um, underinsured and undiagnosed, um, uninsured patients, underinsured patients. And there's a lot of race bias there. You know, we 80% of our patients are Latino or African-American. And we've really created programs for access. We offer our patients the exact same care, including access to clinical trials as the private clinics. So um, I'm really honored to be part of this panel. And, you know, I look forward to the discussion tonight. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for sharing that. Wow. Yes. You know, we, we don't, you said something very um, important. We don't often think of age bias, right? If you're certain, if you're too young, you don't know anything. If you're too old, you're outdated. <laughs> so thank you for, for sharing that. Okay. We're going to move right along to Miss Angelica. Can you share with us why you think it's important to celebrate women and their accomplishments? Absolutely. Um, I think part of it is women here all this white noise all of our entire lives. And sometimes it's really hard to thread out the impact that's having on our trajectory. And I think often we're constantly put in boxes. Um, you mentioned in my biography, I work with Mi Familia Bota, we're advocating for, for justice for the Latinx community. But as a Latina, I also recognize the gender bias that exists in my culture. As I'm trying to honor my culture and celebrate it and promote it, I also have to recognize the, the gender inequities and the machismo culture that continue to persist um, in our society and how that has impacted my upbringing. Um, I, I, I love, love my family. I come from a family of seven children, five women and two boys. And I remember as we were growing up, my parents would love to introduce us. And, you know, and then people would say, wow, you have five daughters. Your house must be clean all the time. And you hear that, right? You, and it's kind of like a mosquito in your ear. And you're just a little eight-year-old kind of sitting on the chair like, okay, that's not me. My mom does not have a very clean house. Oops, I guess we failed. But I think as you grow up, you start to recognize how people have been inching you slowly and slowly to this mold and then there becomes um, this tension where you say, no, that's not where I want to be. That's not what I want to do. I'm looking to other women role models. And that's when celebrating each other becomes super important because that's how we start to break the bias and inch out of that mold and disrupt all these beliefs that we've grown up because women support each other and women know exactly what we're going through. And those are the people that are going to be part of our village as we're trying to create a better society. Awesome. I love that. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. You, you mentioned um, the other women that have been in your life. So if you, and, and this is for anyone that wants to jump in, you know, what would you say to other young women um, who want to step into an untraditional role or who feels limited uh, because of implicit or explicit bias that, that may be holding them back? I'll ask um, Dr. Julie, what do you think? I, I would say there's a couple important things. I think what has helped me in my career tra trajectory is to have good mentors. I, I think it's very hard to be young in a, a world where you're not clear of your trajectory. And what that does is a couple things. It gives you guidance and it gives you confidence. Um, my mentors have honestly all been female until recently and that has helped a lot. I also think anyone can accomplish anything that they put their mind to. Um, you know, some of it is talent, but I think 90% is hard work and dedication. And, you know, when people work hard, when they have clear goals and they have good mentorship, I, I think anyone can be successful no matter their gender, age, race. Thank you. What do you think, Dennis? I run into this mostly with younger trans kids uh, or, or young adults who have not yet transitioned, have not yet gone from male to female or from female to male because they are afraid. They're afraid of uh, how they're gonna be perceived. They're afraid of losing their family, which I did. They're afraid of losing, uh, being asked to leave their church, which I was. They're afraid of uh, uh, being, looked on, made fun of, and so they hold back and they hold back. And I tell them that uh, I did all this in the 70s. And if I could do it then and still be successful today, it's time for them to come out of the closet and be who they are. This is especially true dealing with uh, youngsters and their parents. I have a lot of parents who ask me. Uh, they used to hire me until I finally retired uh, from the practice of law to take their kids through the courts and get their name and gender and, and sex 
changed on their birth certificate. I did that for a long time. But um, I, I tell them all, you've just got to be who you are. And if, if I could survive it, <clears throat> and my spouse who was with me all those 48 years could survive it, uh, they can survive it in 2022. Yes, you have accomplished a lot. And when you think about what all that you've accomplished, like you said, it happened in the 70s and here we are. Um, I, you have such a wealth of knowledge to be able to share. Um, and so it definitely makes the, the, the transition of, of, of being who you are and, and being bold about um, what you want in life, it makes it, it easier. So you've got such a wealth of knowledge. So thank you for that. Um, Angelica, what, what would you say to youth, uh, to young women who are wanting to step into a role that may not be the most traditional role, but who are held back because of fear or limiting beliefs or, or afraid of what others will say or think? Yeah, I think it's, this is a time to redefine who gets to hold power. And so I'll say from my personal experience, I, when I was in high school and I was in college, I never thought that I was going to be a leader because I didn't have personality traits that you tend to see in stereotypical male dominated uh, field. Um, I'm never, I wasn't boisterous. I didn't love to speak up. Um, I didn't find myself being always aggressive or assertive. And so I would reduce myself to saying, I'm gonna play a behind the scenes role. I'm gonna do the work. Um, even though I'm passionate about this topic, I'm not what the audience wants to see, right? I'm not what is currently reflected. So I need to know my place. Um, and I've really had to challenge myself to say, if you are not okay with that, then you have to be part of disrupting that. You have to stay true to yourself and recognize that you have as much, um, you deserve to hold that, that leadership position, that power, those decision-making powers just as much as the next person, because we need to stop again, defining on who gets to hold power, what are the traits and how do we have to change ourselves to meet somebody else's needs. Um, and so I, when I, um, I used to work as a youth organizer, so I have a lot of young, a love for young people, is that fear and intimidation still persists um, in our young audiences where they want to say like, oh, that's just not me, so I can't fit in this box or I can't be what people want. Um, but we need to change that and we need to actively um, mentor people and support them. So as they're going along in that journey, they don't feel like they're doing it by themselves because I didn't have to do it by myself and I can't expect that other people do it by themselves, right? Um, and so I think that's why it's so important that we continue to show up in these spaces and to make sure that people like us that may be sitting in the back know you, you deserve to be here too and you are going to be here one day. Thank you for sharing that. You, you, you said something, I, I think you said, um, I need to know my place. And when I hear you say that, oh my gosh, how many times do we as people, as women, have we felt that? I, I need to know my place because society has told us this is your place, that you belong in this bucket or this category. So when I think of that, that, that comment you just said, you know, how, how do youth, how do people, how do women find their voice to break the bias so that they can break outside of this mode of, I need to, to be in a certain place? And I'm asking that to you first, um, Angelica. I think in order for people to find their voice, I really do think that one representation matters for many reasons. It, it matters maybe different for me than it does to you or other folks on this call. Um, but I think in terms of finding our voice is we also have to allow people to use their voice, even if we might not always agree with it. Um, because once we, if we start shutting down people's comments or beliefs, then we're going backwards. Then we're not being inclusive and we're not changing the trajectory that we wanna see. And so we have to be, as a society, comfortable with being uncomfortable and recognizing that that is good for us and that is good for women and it's good for our young people and it is ultimately good for the future that we wanna see. Um, and so as because I see so many young people start to, to get really active and then get shut down and that just kills morale. And so we, I, I think I try to constantly think about when can I take a step back and then not allow space for another person and they don't have to get it right the first time. We also have to be okay with people making mistakes and helping them along that process. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. Phyllis, what do you think? You're, you're eagerly agreeing. What do you think? How, how can uh, 
youth and women, how can we find our voice to break the bias? Well, uh, the best example I can give is, is when I was growing up, I, uh, I was taught by my parents the same way a lot of children, boys or girls, are taught by their parents a lot of different social values that unfortunately our nation still is grappling with, as an example. Uh, I came from privilege, white, male, Christian, heterosexual, middle class, and I was taught to uh, look down at Jews, look down at Catholics, uh, look down at Hispanics, look down at Blacks, uh, see women as being second class, uh, seeing men as being superior, and all this other garbage that I was taught and lived with uh, through high school and into college. And it wasn't until I finally began dealing with my <clears throat> gender identity that I began to see how much garbage I'd been given. Well, it's the same thing that uh, Angelica described is that we are taught, <clears throat> women especially, are taught you know, not to uh, um, be assertive. I see this in my own community because trans women like myself who grew up with boy privilege are used to uh, speaking up, are used to being assertive. Whereas the trans men who grew up uh, in the feminine role were taught not to be assertive, not to be, uh, not to speak out. And so uh, it's been a struggle over the last several days to get the trans men part of our community to step up and uh, start taking um, <clears throat> a man's place um, uh, in our society. Um, this is all social conditioning that we get from very early age. Absolutely, social conditioning from an early age definitely shapes our views. And um, one of the reasons why we are here today is to learn to break the bias and break those, those social conditionings. Um, Dr. Julie, I'm gonna ask you the same question. You know, how do you people, women in particular, find our voice to, to break the bias? I, I think the biggest thing is we need to give youth confidence. And, um, you know, I, I was lucky. I had very supportive family and friends growing up. And I lived by two rules. My, my father taught me the golden rule, you know, treat others how you would want to be treated. And I wish more people in this world would do that. We're all allowed to have different opinions about things and you can share those and be kind to each other and listen, even if you don't agree with those beliefs. So I think that is very important. And I think people need to be comfortable speaking up when they see something that's not right. And in this world of especially social media, I feel like there are so many youth that are just trying to impress others or do what the trendy thing is or follow the crowd. And it's very hard to break out of that. And I, I, I really do think by living by those two, the one rule, the golden rule. The other thing I got advice very early on when I was in school was to surround yourself by people that bring you up that you know help you achieve your goals that listen to you that don't put you down and i think that's very important too because the people you choose to surround yourself with will help influence your trajectory no matter what your goals are so i think those two things are incredibly important and it's um it's hard to get used to realize that because there's so many competing um noises as angelica was talking about <laughs> Thank you for that. You know, you made a comment about the importance of surrounding yourself with people that lift you up. And in addition to that, one of the things I've been hearing is this idea of mentorship and, and surrounding yourself with the right people. Can each of you speak about um, the lessons that you've learned from those people that you've surrounded yourself with that's been able to help lift you up? Hmm. Phyllis, we'll go with you. <clears throat> Well, of course, my wife um, 
stood by me and stayed with me for all those years. And she was, <clears throat> when I met her, she was, she was five years older than me. Uh, she was a, a music teacher. She had been teaching for seven years. She had her own money. She drove a Mustang, let me tell you. She was sharp. And for some reason, she fell in love with me. And after three years, she said, you've got to be who you are. And if you transition, I'll stay with you. And she did all of those years. Shortly after I transitioned, I was asked by a neighbor, one of the few good neighbors, to join the Houston League of Women Voters. And man, I loved that group. And I've been, I'm still a member of the Houston uh, women voters. And uh, in the late 70s, when, I don't know if y'all know this name or not, Nikki Van Hightower. Nikki Van Hightower was the women's advocate for then mayor Fred Hoffines. And when Jim McCann was elected mayor, the city council, all men who couldn't stand uh, Nikki, but they couldn't fire her because she worked for Fred Hoffines, they voted to reduce her salary to $1 a year. And there was a huge, huge gathering of women at City Hall. And I was one of them protesting back in the uh, uh, 70s. I, I enjoy being involved <clears throat> with women's groups, even as innocent as the Saturday morning coffee clatch I have with six other women here at the retirement center uh, where I live. I get along real well with guys. I learned how to do guy talk when I grew up and I can guy talk with the best of them, but I love to be with women and to chat with women and to listen to women. Is that my dog? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, that's okay. Thank you so much. Dr. Jill, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Um, from the, the women that you have surrounded yourself with that have um, uplifted you as you said a minute ago, um, what lessons have you learned um, from those women or people in general that have empowered you? Yeah, so I've, I've learned a lot of lessons, but most importantly, I've learned to pay things forward. So I had a lot of people give me a lot of good advice. And so um, I am, a, I'm, you know, I'm a doctor, but I'm also an associate professor and I teach. I teach a lot of fellows, a lot of residents, a lot of medical students, mainly fellows that want to specialize in cancer care. And I have personally tried to pay it forward by offering mentorship. And by this, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't have guidance from their family and friends. They may, you know, like for me, my dad immigrated here with very little and started a business and he wanted me to do something to help people. That's kind of how I went into medicine. And I've really wanted to pay forward all the advice in terms of career trajectories, you know, finances. I, I feel like a lot of people are not taught finances, you know, loans, debt, how to, you know, get a career, take care of your family, um, for people to really understand what they want in life and what's important, whether it's the job, family, location. And, you know, it, it sounds interesting, but I was even taught good body language. Like people are not taught that. And in leadership, you need to know good communication skills, body language, and just simple posture changes. So these are small things, just examples that were taught to me. But in my everyday training, when I work with fellows, trainees, even junior faculty starting in medicine, I try to pay it forward and teach them all those same life lessons that were taught to me. And I've taught them to ask, to not be afraid to ask and that there's never a stupid question. And I think that's really important to tell people too, that, you know, if you're thinking it, just ask. <laughs> you're right, because if you're thinking it, someone else is probably thinking it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And Hanukkah, we'll, we'll chip it to you as well. Um, when we think about surrounding yourself with women that have uplifted you and empowered you, what lessons have you learned? Yeah, I think it's it's really clear to me now in my journey that I'm not fighting to be the exception. I'm not fighting to just be one, the one that made it right. We're fighting for equity. We're fighting for everyone. We're fighting for everyone to be in the room with us, to be in that 
to be recognized like we are. And I think that has really come from the women that have mentored me and have talked about how lonely it was for them in some, some of these situations. And they don't want that, right? And I don't wanna mimic that and I don't wanna continue that. And so I think it's, it's constantly uplifting when people remind me like, this is, we wanna help you, but we wanna help those around you too. And you have a role and responsibility and putting that responsibility on my shoulders, I think is really important and that we continue to pass that down. And then I just wanna echo what, um, uh, what uh, Dr. Nangia was saying in like economic empowerment is super important. Um, so when we're in positions of power and deciding, in deciding um, economics, how are we making sure that we're looking at that from an equity standpoint? How are we making sure that we're using our decision-making power to level the playing field? Um, because I think women also have a responsibility in that. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'd like to ask you, do you have any regrets? And if so, what are they? You know, What might you have done differently? I don't touch that. I don't touch that. I never do. I have a lot of them. You'll never know what they are. You'll never know what they are. And I don't dwell on them because I am the person I am today because of the choices that I made, whether they were good choices or bad choices, whether I hurt people deliberately, unintentionally, or embraced other people and lifted them up. Anything that I would have changed back then would have affected the rest of my life. I have a very happy life. I have a very wonderful life. I'm very pleased with my career in law, which I retired from. I'm very pleased that I'm still an associate judge, which is, you know, being a judge is fun. It's prestigious. And it also allows me to marry people. That's also fun. Um, I wouldn't change anything. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Julia, what about you? Are there, do you have any regrets or things that maybe you would have maybe done differently or that you would apply to differently? Yeah, so my, I think my biggest regret, and a lot of women make this mistake, is women want things to be perfect. So for example, like my promotion, which is linked to salary success, a lot of things was delayed because I wanted my application to be perfect. And many of my counterparts, especially men, will just submit something, right? And I, I wish I had kind of learned that lesson earlier. Um, I, I would have had even a better career trajectory, you know, but I think people are too hard on themselves and other people and you need to let go of perfection. You know, no one's perfect. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. You know, if you're like 90% there, go for it, you know? And I, I think that's, women are more guilty of making this mistake than men. <laughs> oh my goodness. I love that. You're so right. We stay in this, um, you know, analysis paralysis mode and we overthink. And so that you mentioned before, I was just reading a book that said, you know what, if you're at 80%, go for it. Don't sit and wait to 100%. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And how like a, what about you? Is there anything um, that you maybe regret or that you would do differently if you had the opportunity? I, I don't know if it's necessarily a, a regret, but just something that I think I've grown from. Uh, I grew up not knowing any, any professionals other than teachers. Um, uh, my parents have a first grade degree. My dad has a first grade degree. My mom has like uh, a fifth grade education. And so I was so enamored with this idea that I wanted to surround myself with women that had accolades, that had degrees, that had accomplishment in the words that I don't know that I always appreciated that women are strong no matter what. Women are resilient no matter what. And, and that I am who I am today because of that, right? And so as I reflect back on my journey, I think about the maintenance staff during college that would sit down and talk to me in Spanish, right? The people that helped me along the way. And so I think now I try to make sure as I'm mentoring young women that don't not don't just enamor yourself with, with the shiny stuff and the gold, right? Like you're strong no matter what. You're strong right now. And you're going to continue to, you know, become a greater leader, but you also have to appreciate every single woman around you that is trying to do good, that is trying to 
um, to support you along the way. Um, and don't ever forget that. So I think that's, again, part of my own growth. Oh, I love that. And if only we all knew of what you just spoke about, that all that glitters is not gold, right? <laughs> Yvonne, are you stepping in now? <laughs> well, but before she does, I want to point y'all to another strong woman who's not on this pen. And that, her name, everybody can see my name, F-R-Y-E. Her name is Trish, T-R-I-S-H, Trish Fry. And when she passed away, the Houston Chronicle gave her a page and a half, a page and a half. Uh, and if you will Google Trish Fry, legacy, you will read about one of the strongest women that there ever was. And I hope you read that. Thank you, Phyllis. I am uh, writing that down on my sticky notes so that I can go Google. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you all for being so vulnerable and open for sharing. Well, Clorinda, it's great to join you back here. Let me make sure my volume is up. There we go. Is that a little better? Wonderful. Well, I know Dr. Julie Clorinda said, let go of perfection, but this was the perfect way to kick off International Women's Day and Women's History Month. So great job moderating the panel. I just have, um, I'm excited, I'm really on fire after what um, we have heard um, today. Um, Phyllis, to hear you say you fought to be a woman. Um, it just, it touched my soul. Um, to hear you say that. Well, I did. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but it just resonated in, in such a powerful way. Um, you know, Dr. Julie, you were so adept at pointing out other bias that we face. So we're here talking about women, but there's just so much going on. And then um, Angelica, you reminded us that there's a lot of noise, right? Um, I think you referred to it as, as the white noise and the system that you hear and just really trying to focus in on those voices that truly do matter. Um, that's how I, I perceived um, that comment that you made. And um, I know so much Clorinda um, that was said tonight was geared towards like advice to potentially youth or young women, but it's advice across all ages. So super important. Um, so I'd like to um, just ask very quickly, I know um, the theme for this year's International Women's Day is um, break the bias, um, but on a personal level, uh, I know that we all understand that bias is also to our individual journey. What have you done to recognize some of your own biases and to learn to mitigate them? Well, I already told you about mine that I grew up with in the... Uh, in my late teens and, and 20s, I shucked my anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic, anti-Black, anti-Hispanic. You know, if, if, if the Muslim community had been uh, as it is today, I would have probably been taught to hate those people too. Uh, but uh, I'm very thankful that I was able to, to uh, break that bias. And uh, I remember in 1970, I don't remember which year it was, um, I was a delegate to one of the parties, we're supposed to be nonpartisan. I think you can figure out which one would have me, but anyway, uh, to one of their state conventions. And I became a Jesse Jackson delegate. And I was very proud of that and all the people that I met at the conventions. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And Helica, what about you? Any um, work that you've done just to understand and mitigate your own biases? Yeah, I think I now reflect a lot more, because particularly I oversee a team. So when I'm um, engaging with them and really mentoring them and, and helping them in their work, work and, and personal and professional development, um, I think about why did you spend time with the person you spend time with and not the other person? So why are you investing in one person more than the other? Or why are you making the decisions that you are making? And is it is it true to your values? And if not, then, then how are you going to make a change immediately? Because so I think I've been trying to flex that muscle a lot more actively in the, at least the past one year, two years. And it's helped me a lot, 
a lot, I think. And I would advise that to, to supervisors, think about why you're making the decision and justify it to yourself and list out the values that you're using to justify your decision-making. Thank you. Um, Clorinda, um, earlier in the discussion, Angelica um, made a comment about tying to knowing your place and need to know your place. And I know that you chimed in on that. Um, how did you um, really just start to learn that I get to decide what my place is and I have the confidence to take my journey and to define my own place? Thank you, Yvonne. You know, I've had to learn along the way that at some point we have to stop listening to ourselves and start talking to ourselves. Okay, tell me more about that. What I say by, what I mean by that is, you know, our, th our thoughts are so powerful. And, you know, we often we have these little nuggets of these, this self-sabotaging limiting beliefs. And if we stay on that thought for too long, we begin to um, believe it. And then we, we start to recite that thought. And so I've found, I've had a history of just, you know, oh, I believe this about me, or I believe that about me. All these negative thoughts that society says you should think this way or you shouldn't feel this way. And so I found out that I've had to start telling myself, no, you don't belong in this mode. You don't have to necessarily um, follow what some free script that you're supposed to live, but I have to start telling myself who I am, what I believe, and what my journey is. Mm -hmm. And so if we stay in this position of listening to ourselves, we can talk ourselves out of opportunities. We can talk ourselves out of our own greatness and destiny because of these self-sabotaging thoughts. And so instead, I just learned to, to talk to myself. Don't listen, but no, I talk to myself and I tell myself, this is who you are and this is where you're gonna go in life. And oftentimes too, Clorinda, that process ties to something that Dr. Julie says, um, this um, desire to be perfect, right? We don't even know that we're talking ourselves out of opportunities. We're just, you know, saying until this happens or until I get better at this, these things can't happen. Um, but we've got to shut down all of that, um, that talk in our heads and really just say, I'm ready now. I can walk into this opportunity now and um, be more of a support for ourselves and not self-sabotaging. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I, I think that we have to learn to detach from the outcome. We mm -hmm. have a, um, we've got this, how it is supposed to look or how it should look. But when we detach from the outcome, we open ourselves up to this massive possibility and opportunities of what it could be versus what it should be, you know? And I'll add to that, detaching from the outcome and the process. Just be open. Be open to the possibilities. Absolutely. <laughs> And so many of you um, tonight shared your thoughts about mentorship. And I would say even in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion, now we talk often too about sponsorship. So those who open doors and windows and create opportunities. Um, but talk about when men have shown up in this space and have been those mentors and those sponsors for you. <laughs> Joe <laughs> Garino. Okay. Joe Garino. Judge Joe Garino. He has since passed. But when I uh, was a third year law student and I wanted to get uh, an internship, which a lot of third years do, uh, I wanted to get it with the DA's office because I knew that if I got my internship with a civil office, that they would stick me in the law library and I wouldn't learn anything about the courtroom. And I needed courtroom experience because I knew no one would hire me. And so I asked to be put in the DA's office. DA at the time was Johnny Holmes. And he told uh, my professor, uh, Jim Hensley, who placed people for internship, that there was no way that I was gonna be allowed. And Jim, bless his heart, he just told uh, Johnny Holmes that if you don't accept her, you don't get any more interns from the University of Houston Law School. So he agreed to accept me. Uh, problem was we still had the cross-dressing ordinance. So he said, if I showed up in a dress, he was going to have me arrested. Well, of course, this takes us back to uh, Johnny Goyan, city council member, and Ernest McGowan, city council member. Those two were the champions uh, and Lance Whaler that helped get rid of that ordinance <laughs> four days before I was supposed to show up <laughs> at the DA's office. 
so I'm at the DA's office, and of course, I get assigned the Phyllis Fry restroom, and it's down on the second floor. I'm my office is on the tenth floor, and I have to go through a security guard to get to the second floor and walk past a whole bunch of secretaries to use the Phyllis Fry restroom. Well, I did that twice, and I said I'm not going to parade myself to go to the restroom, and so. I would uh, quickly run over to the building next door and use the restrooms there. And about two weeks passed and I got called in and said that if I didn't use the Phyllis Fry restroom, they were gonna uh, terminate me. And uh, I was assigned to Johnny Goins court. He was a district judge. And uh, so I, I went to him and I was in tears. <laughs> he, he, uh, <laughs> said what's wrong and I told him and he just got red in the face and he walked out into the ante room and his he told his uh, court coordinator get the recorder get the court reporter here get the uh, clerks in here get the bailiffs in here get everybody that works for me in here now and two minutes later they were all assembled and he looked at me and he looked at them and he said you see that door which was the door to his chambers he said, if she's here and she even looks at that door, you unlock that door. And he looked at me and he said, you can use Judge Garino's restroom. I mean, that's the silly ass kind of fights that I've had to deal with most of my life. But Joe Garino and Johnny Goyne and Ernest McGowan and Lance Laylor, I've had a boatload of wonderful, wonderful men, as well as lots and lots and lots of wonderful women. Uh, who have uh, stepped up for me. I love that story. I could listen to you all night, Phyllis. It's all in the book. <laughs> You're going to have to get that book. You said it comes out on June 12th. So, June 12th uh, during Pride Month. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You can, so you can Amazon, you can Amazon my name and you'll, you'll, you'll see it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Well, I, I want to be sensitive to the time and just cognizant of the time. And um, Corinda would love to back in and just, you know, after all that we've learned tonight, after this basically our start to Women's History Month and International Women's Day, where do we go from here? Um, Clorinda, Dr. Julie, Angelica, what are your thoughts? What's maybe short gain wins that we can, you know, have this month or even some long term views and perspectives? Wins for women. I, I personally think we need better formal mentorship programs for young women who want any careers. Um, you know, I was lucky I, you know, had good parents, good friends, good support. But I think there are a lot of young women there who don't have the proper role models and help they need. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how you go about that, but I think there are many women in this world that would be willing to be mentors. We just need to have the pairing system. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for those looking for a mentor, they're all around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. Clorinda? I want to say one more thing before we close. There's a lot of college students, I'm hoping, that are listening to this and want to figure out what their next term paper is. If you will Google my name, you'll find a ton of stuff. And if you will Google Phyllis Fry archives, you will find the 56 years of stuff that I've written or has been written about me uh, that is housed in the archives at Texas A&M University. It's all been digitized. And one of the things you will find in there that you will really enjoy is the International Bill for Gender Rights. You can, it's on Wikipedia also, the International Bill for Gender Rights. You'll find that. You want to read it, print it out. Yes. Thank you, Phyllis. Absolutely. So many great resources coming from you. Clorinda, I'd love to hear from you and then Angelica from you as well. So again, path forward. Yeah. You know what? I think, I think, I think we chatted about this the other day, Yvonne. I think about um, the three A's having awareness. If we're not aware of a problem, we just continue and we, we continue to walk in 
having a bias, so we continue to stereotype, we continue to have these false narratives that we create. So I think it's important for us to, to have awareness around these, situ these issues. I think next, after the awareness that we abstain, we abstain from um, the bias. Once we are aware that we have our own bias, that, that, that we are um, operating in behaviors that are stereotyping, um, that we abstain from that. And then next, it's important that we learn to advocate that we advocate for one another, that we, we partner with one another and we build community and connection so that we can advocate for the rights of others. Because as um, each of us have said on this call, the importance of guidance and the importance of mentorship and the importance of standing on the shoulders of others that come before us, it's it's through that advocacy that we're able to, to break the bias. And so I'll leave with that. Give us the A's again, Clorinda. Oh, the A's are... Um, Awareness, abstain, and advocate. Thank you. Thank you. Angelica, your thoughts? Yeah, and I wanted to go back to a couple of questions that I saw coming through our chat around men allies and, and just really supportive uh, partners and spouses. And that just goes a really long way and very indicative that it's, this is going to take everyone. You know, no one can sit by the sidelines. No one can say, this isn't my fight or I'm good. I'm, I'm done. I did what I needed to do. It's going to take a constant, consistent and active effort to really attain gender equity. Um, so this fight is far from over. And to the women in the room, I really say there are times where you need to be the strong one and there are times where you need to be the vulnerable one. And it's okay to be both. You know, we need to, and we need to surround ourselves with women that are okay with that. Like we can't put a strong face on every single day. Um, and again, there are times where we have to be strong for the women around us. Absolutely. And um, what powerful words to um, bring us um, to that point that I don't want to, but um, I've really enjoyed um, learning from all of you uh, this evening. Um, the stories that you've shared have been amazing, truly inspirational. Um, can't say it again or enough. What a great way to kick off Women's History Month and International Women's Day. So um, one thing that we've learned is that no one is immune um, from bias, but um, clearly with what you've shared today, we are leaving here better, more powerful, and um, more able to address those biases as they show up for us in our individual journeys. So thank you so much. Um, thanks to all the panelists. Um, Margie Levin, thank you for um, planning this event. Erica and Becca, thank you for your support as well. Thanks to all of the ADL team. And we thank everyone for your time and for your participation tonight. Thank you very much. This concludes our program for this evening.